I think that sometimes the things a work of art takes for granted can be just as interesting and meaningful as those things the artist consciously includes in the work and brings to the fore. We might call this the background. That which informs the work is present all throughout and yet could go by completely unnoticed. On the surface, Kimagure Orange Road may seem like a rather straightforward rom-com, wrapped up in a colourful and technically exuberant 80s aesthetic. However, I would posit that the most interesting and significant dimension of this coming-of-age story is hiding in plain sight. If we look past the familiar cast of characters, the comedic hijinks and convenient qui pro quos, a pattern starts to emerge. If I say coffee shops, rock music, biker gangs and ski resorts, what do all of these things have in common? Well, they're all, arguably, the result of the westernization of Japanese culture and society, and thus, together, they provide a picture of life in post-war Japan, and more specifically, a post-war Japan traversing the economic boom of the 1980s, where all of these cultural trends and economic excesses came to the fore. You might not think of coffee shops as being particularly significant in this regard, but throughout Japan's history, coffee has been a commodity charged with strong cultural undertones. As Helena Grinchpun explores in her article, Deconstructing a Global Commodity, Coffee, Culture and Consumption in Japan, coffee is strongly associated with the West, so much so that coffee import was even banned during World War II at the time of Japan's conflict with certain Western nations. It was only after the war that coffee was gradually reintroduced into Japanese society and became a marker of an Americanized middle class. Grinchman writes that goods of Euro-American origin define middle-class modernity in the transwar period. This definition was rooted in the association between the ideals of the modern middle-class lifestyle and the images of Western, notably American, life. She goes on to say that the names of the local cafes also exemplify this tendency. While many of them carry Japanese names, Western or Western-sounding names predominate. In Leaf, a monthly magazine dedicated to Kyoto dining and cafes, more than two-thirds of the listed coffee shop names are in European languages, mostly English, less frequently French, and sometimes, as in the case of bakeries and family restaurant chains, not always intelligible in any foreign language, but nevertheless projecting a Western or international image. In early 20th century Japan, coffee shops also brought with them the figure of the jokyu, or cafe waitress, which came to be the personification of the modern girl archetype. Japanese women who started following Western trends and fashion following World War I. We see this illustrated in Junichiro Tanizaki's 1924 novel Naomi, in which the protagonist falls under the spell of a young waitress who, for him, embodies the physical representation of everything Western. Grinchman writes that the role of jokyu provided to lower-class women not only a new occupation, but also relative personal freedom. The jokyu were the working-class personification of the modern girl, which can be seen as a key ideological construct in Japan's modern transformation. It's not hard to see why this context may be of relevance to the one particular character in Orange Road who starts working at a coffee shop with a Western name, but we'll talk further about the concept of the modern girl in a second. Before that, let's take a look at episode episode 13 of Orange Road, where the whole gang goes to see a rock concert featuring a band named Bobson. What stands out to me about this sequence is the location, because the concert takes place at a temple, so we see an interesting contrast of the Western-influenced cultural product, the rock band, and the traditional Japanese setting of a shrine. And this reminds me of something else Grinchbun describes in the opening section of her essay. A shopping mall in Kyoto where an outer glass wall overlooks the Buddhist temple of Rokaku-do, just a few meters away. We might compare this site to the tradition of shake, or borrowed scenery, in garden design, which is the practice of visually incorporating elements from outside the garden into the scenery in order to create an illusion that the garden extends beyond its physical borders and capture the continuity between interior and exterior. Building upon Koichi Iwabuchi's concept of cultural odors, which she defines as the way in which cultural features of a country of origin and images or idea of its national, in most cases stereotyped way of life, are associated positively with a particular product in the consumption process, Grinchpun comments that the borrowed scenery of this shopping mall architecture exemplifies a mix of cultural odors which, due to their sharp contrast with one another, highlight two polarities of the Japanese cultural 
for construction. The old tradition on the one hand, and the incorporation of new, often foreign, mostly western trends on the other. And so this episode of Orange Road does not simply present us with just another typical rom-com story about the twists and turns and many misunderstandings that organise the dynamics of this love triangle, rather it secretly presents us with the picture of a culture in which a specific kind of Americanized modernity is subsuming or at the very least overlapping with Japan's traditional past. This is perfectly encapsulated in this shot where we see the concert stage in the background and a temple bell in the foreground. This is the shake, the borrowed scenery that takes the exterior of western modernity and incorporates it into the interior of traditional Japan. And another thing that's particularly interesting about this episode is how these Western or Western-influenced cultural products are associated with maturity. All throughout the episode, Kyosuke says that Hikaru's Western-style clothing makes her look mature, and that going to this rock concert makes him feel like a grown-up. Of course, simply stating that an anime made in the 80s is full of cultural artifacts from the 80s isn't a particularly astute observation in and of itself, but it's how that cultural context shapes the way the story and the character arcs play out and gives rise to particular themes which is of great significance to us here. And this is where Madoka comes in. Madoka embodies a kind of modern girl figure, a modern girl of the 80s, and not just because she works in a coffee shop. You may notice that Madoka is at the centre of most of these plots that involve references to Western cultural trends. It's within her character that all of these background elements and ideas find their fullest expression, and it's through her character and how the protagonist Kyosuke relates to her character that these elements are thematized. In fact, that Western-style outfit Hikaru wore in episode 13 was borrowed from Madoka. She is the character most explicitly associated with maturity implicitly because of her, let's say, non-traditional behavior and association with Western trends. And so if we take a step back, we see that, on the historical scale, Japan's entry into modernity under the influence of the West, and more specifically the US, is encapsulated here on a personal level in the lives of these Japanese teenagers and their equating of Western culture and fashion with maturity. Modernity is maturity in this coming-of-age story. It's interesting in this light to remember that Madoka is often seen as one of the original embodiments of the tsundere archetype, and given Madoka's cultural significance in this story, to think of the tsundere archetype as containing implicit thematic ties to the modern girl and as representing a transformative conception of femininity in modern Japan. In Orange Road's conception of Japanese modernity, changing times means changing gender roles, and this is such a crucial aspect of Madoka and Kyosuke's dynamic. From the get-go, Madoka is explicitly characterized as a bit of a tomboy, as not really conforming to traditional notions of femininity. She's certainly no Yamato Nadeshko. In episode 1, she single-handedly fights off a gang of high school delinquents, and repeatedly throughout the show, Madoka saves the day by beating people up. Impossible here to avoid addressing the sukeban trend that was extremely popular at the time. Sukeban or delinquent girls were female gangs that rose to prominence in the 70s and quickly became a recognizable archetype in Japanese fiction. Madoka was part of one of these gangs and the characters actually fight a sukeban in episode 27. And then in episode 36, the characters even make a movie about a sukeban gang. But like I said, what's important here is not really the reference to contemporary trends, but what it means for Kyosuke and Madoka's relationship. And episode 14 is a great illustration of this, because it demonstrates clearly the insecurities that arise within Kyosuke due to Madoka's unconventional gender expressions. The episode opens with a dream, where Madoka calls Kyosuke a coward, and the storyline of this episode is all about the female characters getting really into wrestling, and how that makes Kyosuke feel insecure about his masculinity. He doesn't want Madoka to perceive him as weak, and he feels threatened by her physical superiority, and interprets that dream as meaning that he needs to man up and learn how to fight. It's also probably worth noting that in order to restate his masculinity, Kyosuke returns to a traditional Asian martial art, karate, as opposed to the Western-style wrestling that the girls have adopted. 
This insecurity also awakens a kind of condescending paternalistic instinct within Kyosuke, which we see when his younger sisters talk about getting into pro wrestling and his first thought is, and we've actually seen this behavior before in the very first episode. And again in episode 23, when Madoka calls Kyosuke a goody two shoes, he literally fantasizes about enacting a more traditional gender dynamic, in which he slaps Madoka and she falls to her knees and apologizes to him, something we might see in an old movie. But when he awakens from this fantasy, Madoka again restates her dominance. Here, Kyosuke encounters a kind of dissonance. He feels belittled and confused by Madoka's unconventional character, and the fantasy scene makes sure to connect that frustration to a concept of changing gender dynamics. Kyosuke might not know it consciously, but what he is contending with here is Japanese modernity in the 80s. His frustration is that of an individual experiencing a cultural shift, a cultural confusion. He is swept up in the tide of history, and the anime elegantly depicts how the emotions of one teenage boy are confounded by the crossing of cultural and historical currents in one teenage girl, Madoka. This is what Kimagure Orange Road is all about. It's one of those shows where the viewer might think, why don't they just get together already? And while the surface level plot answer to that question may be that Kyosuke really messed things up by going out with Hikaru, and the longer he waits, the harder it'll be to break up with her, as we'll see in the movie later on, the true underlying thematic answer to that question is that Kyosuke is yet to resolve these inner frustrations. Throughout most of the series, he is still contending with Madoka as this strange entity that utterly confounds him. He doesn't know what to to do or how to deal with his conflicting emotions. But Kyosuke isn't the only one with conflicting feelings. It won't do to flatten Madoka's character into this simple, symbolic representation of Japan's cultural shift. She is much more than that, and it's clear to see that her character contains complexity and inner conflict as well. In episode 17, we see that Madoka is secretly excited at the prospect of wearing her yukata to the fireworks show, and more specifically going there with Kyosuke and having him see her in the yukata. And back in episode 14, she talks of her love for the tale of Princess Orihime and Hikoboshi, the star-crossed lovers who are celebrated on Tanabata, which you've probably seen a million times in anime. In fact, that dream that opened that episode where Madoka called Kyosuke a coward that's who the two of them were embodying, the star-crossed lovers. That's why they're dressed like that. So it's clear that there is a part of Madoka that sometimes falls back into these more traditional conceptions of gender identity and romance, which clashes with the modern image of womanhood that she usually projects. And this almost stereotypical tension between tradition and modernity that we often associate with Japan runs all throughout the series. For a long time, I was unsure of how to interpret Kyosuke's family's supernatural abilities, and whether or not there really was anything to read into that aspect of the story. It seemed to me a somewhat arbitrary addition to the basic rom-com premise, a gimmick, essentially. That was until episode 34, where we hear the backstory of how Kyosuke's father, a photographer from the big city, met Kyosuke's mother, the descendant of a long line of supernaturally endowed people living in the mountains. At first, Kyosuke's grandfather didn't want to marry his daughter off to this man because of his belief that, well, to put it plainly, the bloodline should be kept pure. There's a clear fairy tale like feel to this story which explicitly underlines this idea of tradition and modernity coming together, an isolated traditional Japan opening itself up to modernity. It's the show at its most overtly allegorical, and it explains the significance of Kyosuke's power as this marker, this remnant of a quote unquote pure, isolated Japan, a tradition, a legacy. And it reframes those comedic hijinks 
mechanics involving Kyosuke's endless attempts to hide his powers from the other characters, getting himself into all sorts of sticky situations. It reframes all that as representing the difficulty of that legacy, that tradition, that history, integrating into this new, chaotic, globalized culture it doesn't quite feel comfortable in just yet. A world it still, at times, clashes with. So that's it, the marriage of tradition and modernity. The show is telling us that that's how the story began all those years ago. That's the marriage that, quite literally, gave birth to our protagonist, our present situation. And it's exactly how the story will end when Kyosuke and Madoka finally come together as well, and those enduring tensions are eventually resolved. At first glance, the Orange Road movie, which finally puts an end to the show's central love triangle, doesn't really seem to add anything to this historicist reading of the series, choosing instead to focus on the emotional impact of the breakup, providing the viewer with a profoundly intimate and heartbreaking insight into the characters' psyches at this pivotal moment in their lives. That being said, this emotional impact is enough to reframe our understanding of the entire series thus far. Indeed, it's impossible to ignore the sharp tonal shift that takes place between the series and the movie. Long gone are the days of youthful innocence and colourful hijinks. This time around, even the supernatural powers are completely gone, they're never even mentioned in the movie. What we're left with is a painfully constructed picture of a broken heart. After this, there is no chance of reconciliation, no going back. The past is in the past, and only the future awaits us. Even though the series was made in the 80s, the running motif of the snapshots that punctuate scenes all throughout the series endows the anime with a strong sense of nostalgia for that time. A strong sense of time slipping through our fingers. It's as though the show itself knows that these days of economic exuberance cannot last forever. This is why the film's title, I Want to Return to That Day, is so appropriate. The show does not just capture the sense of a specific time and place, rather, its very existence as an artifact of 80s Japan and that ever-growing distance between us and that era is itself conveyed in the series and its melancholy resolution in the movie. And that's how Kimagure Orange Road self-reflexively portrays and embodies the circumstances of its own creation, as well as the implicit impossibility of ever returning to that day. <laughs> 